Well, Mike, it's so nice to be here with you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Aw. <laughs> Let's have some wine, shall we? Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. You want to do the honors? Oh, boy. Now you really put me to the test. <laughs> no screw top on that one. No, it's not a screw top, but you got to take this off. Oh, you'll first. take that off. Oh, I usually dig a knife in there like oh, an unclassy lady. <laughs> now, how come you don't have one of these just push in and push out pop top things here? This is old school. Oh, man, this is really old school. This is so old school. We're going to be in a little trouble here. <laughs> I hope you like corking. We need your, to call someone. <laughs> I, I hope you like corking your wine. Here, maybe. You know, let's have a look. Let's have a look. I'm not too good at opening these. Somebody always opens it for me. Oh, okay. Because oh, that's how Mike Sexton rolls. I was rolls. going the wrong way. <laughs> now I get it. I think you're doing it. All right. You're going to have to pull it out, though. Right, keep it over here in case you spill it so it'll be on you instead of me. <laughs> That takes muscles. I'm not sure we should be filming this. <laughs> no, it's for the blooper reel. <laughs> I think we almost got it. Woo! Oh man, I'm worn out. I need a nap now. <laughs> All right, let me do the honors here. Oh, uh, we need a glass of wine after that. Agreed. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, here we are. Here we are. To Mike Sexton. Well, how about the Lynn and the World Poker Tour and mm. good times, good memories, and more Many. good times to come. Absolutely. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, that's nice. Very nice. We're supposed to swirl it around. Stuff yeah, like. we're supposed to look like we know what we're doing, right? Like you know what you're doing. Yeah, you're <laughs> you filled it up too much. Legs and then, no. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Breathe it in. Okay. Mm. Mm. Yes, we're a couple of winos, but forgive us. <laughs> yeah. We love to drink it. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not an educated drinker, I guess. <laughs> So, Mike, 15 years ago, you were a part of the small group of people that, you know, came together to start the World Poker Tour to pitch the idea, and one of the very few that are still here 15 seasons later. Tell yeah. us about those first days. Oh, boy. It was exciting times. It actually came up at lunch in Costa Rica. We were at a poker tournament down there. We went down with Linda Johnson, and Steve Lipscomb had come down. She invited him down. He just filmed our party, Poker Million that we just had, so we went down there and we went to lunch with Steve and he told us his grandiose idea about the World Poker Tour and wanted to get our opinion of it. And of course we thought, whoa, it's the greatest thing we've ever heard, you know? So of course we loved the idea. Now at that time, Linda Johnson was the most prominent person in the poker world, had more contacts and, you know, tight with the casinos and the most respected person in the poker world and had done more for poker than anybody in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steve, uh, it invited me because he had filmed my tournament of champions the last year I did it, and he liked the way I did the commentary there, but I didn't know anything about being a commentator yet on the World Poker Tour. That, that came up later. But right now, he told us the idea, and he was trying to get money because he had no money. He had a 10-year plan, but it was going to take him $3.5 million for the first couple of years, which he didn't have to film all the events, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, do you know anybody? you think would like to be interested in being a part of this and would film it. And he said, I'll do it on a 50-50 basis if somebody comes up with the money. And I told him I did. I said, Steve, I said, I have two people that I'm sure I can get you a sit down with to talk about the World Poker Tour. Both very prominent, both love poker, and both have a lot of money and a lot of context. I said, the first is Lyle Berman. Lyle is in the Poker Hall of Fame. He was a casino man of the year in 1996, and he'd only been in the casino business a couple years, and to get that title was really prominent in the casino business. And I knew he'd buy the rights to the World Series of Poker to televise them back in 1990. Mm -hmm. And they turned him down because they didn't just want one event a year on television. They wanted a series of events that led up to a championship event. So I knew this World Poker Tour would be perfect for him, because that's just what Steve had in mind. And 
So I said, we can start with him. I said, but then we can also go to Jerry Buss, the owner of the Los Angeles Lakers. I felt certain he'd be very interested in doing it. So those are the guys we started with. I set up the first meeting in Las Vegas with Lyle Berman, and Steve and I went to see Lyle. And knocked on the door and went in his condo, lavish condo here in town. And, and as soon as we sat down and Steve started talking about the World Poker Tour, Lyle brought out his 1990 World Series of Poker televised plans, and he still had them from all those years ago. Wow. And he was telling Steve about his ideas and blah, blah, you know, before we could even get started. <laughs> and uh, so finally when we left, uh, Lyle was nodding his head, and he said, you know, uh, I'm a little interested, but, you know, I don't really know that you can get casino partners to do this to all come together for one project. It's never been done before in the history of casinos. No casino wants to tie their reputation onto a job some other casino does. Mm -hmm. Like if they fail in this event over here, it's going to reflect badly on their casino. And being in the casino business, that was his biggest concern. So Steve and I got a hold of Linda because she knew everybody in the casinos, in the poker world anyway, and... He won the second meeting, and we said we'd bring Linda back to the second meeting. So we took Linda with us, like, the next day. And now Linda said, look, you know, I think these poker room managers are going to love it. I think they can sell it. I think it'll work. And the first place she used to start is Foxwoods Casino. At that time, Foxwoods was the largest casino in the world. Wow. Yeah, the biggest in the world. And so she set the appointment up with Kathy Raymond. Mm -hmm. It was Kathy and all the chiefs there at the at Foxwoods, and Steve presented his idea, and they said they'd call him. And before he got out of the casino, his phone rang, and they said Foxwoods is in. So the first casino he went to, Foxwoods, the biggest in the world, signed up. Next place he came was de Blasio in Las Vegas. They came on board. Then we went to Commerce, the largest poker room in the world. They jumped on board. So right away you had the three largest poker properties in the world probably at that time all signing up with the World Poker Tour. And the rest fell in line like dominoes, and that was history. And that's how the World Poker Tour started. Uh, it was just like that. Now, it wasn't quite that easy with Lyle <laughs> because Lyle was putting up the money. And Steve called me the next day after we'd met the three of us had met him. He said, Mike, he said, Lyle would like to do it. He said, but I can't do it with Lyle. I said, you can't do it with Lyle. Why not? He said, because Lyle wants 70% and wants to give us 30% on the World Poker Tour. He said, I'm not doing it for less than 50-50. I said, Steve, I think you're making a big mistake. I said, Lyle is like the most prominent casino man in the world. He can pick up the phone, get Donald Trump on the other end of the phone if he calls him. And he's got power, and he knows poker, and he loves it. And I said, I know you want a 50-50 deal. I said, but look at it this way. You're going to have an opportunity to make your dream come true, a shot at fulfilling a dream to put on this world poker tour. I said, if it works, you're going to be a millionaire anyway. I said, if it doesn't, worst case scenario, you're going to have a job for two years of employment and have a shot to make your dream come true. He hung up, he went before, right before he hung up, he said, Mike, I'm not doing it on a 70 30. Then he hung up. Then the next day he called me back. He said, Mike, I changed my mind. I'm going with Lyle. And that's how the World Poker Tour started. Wow. Yeah. So it was exciting. And then obviously the first event we ever did was at Bellagio. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was in July of 2002, and it was a big smash hit with the players. I mean, the players, obviously, the buzz you can imagine. You have to remember, people can't remember back before the World Poker Tour nowadays. So many players out on tour, nobody even knew what it was like back in those days. Poker was just a blip on the radar. I mean, it was nothing back then. Yeah. Every poker room was shutting down around the country at, those, at that time, you know. And they were closing poker rooms, you know. Amazing. And there wasn't one no-limit hold'em game in any casino <laughs> in the world on a regular basis, in the country here. Wow. You know, on, a, any, on any kind of daily basis. And yet now we're going to bring in a televised World Poker Tour event of No Limit Hold'em because that's what they played, you know, for the championship of the World Series. So that's the game that we adopted. Plus, it's the easiest game for television. <laughs> People don't even play poker can understand, you know, the all-in concept, you know. It's the king of the hill. One guy gets all the chips. If he says he's all-in, somebody's going to go broke maybe. They understand that, and that's exciting. And so we chose No Limit Hold'em. And literally, uh, with the event at Bellagio that we filmed here, it was very excited, buzz. You know, six phenomenal players at the final table. The least known player at the table by far was Gus Hansen. He was the only one at the table nobody knew. You had John Jawanda, Scotty Wynn, John Hennigan, all these guys at the final table uh, that were massive in the poker world. 
uh, Freddie Deeb, and and then there was Gus Hansen, and then Gus won the tournament. Okay, so now, as you know, we can't see the players' cards when we're filming the final tables. You know, it's against gaming laws. So what happens is, if somebody's all in or something, we can comment then because the cards are face up, or some we're talking about a player we might be seeing then or. You know, but probably only 20% of what we say on the day of the final table makes it to the TV show. The other 80% is done back in a studio in L.A. So we go back. Now we watch the whole tournament again where we see the cards. They splice it all together, and that's the magic of television that makes it come out. But when we went back and we watched that first show, that first final table with Gus Hansen, who was raised on every Garfunkel hand you can imagine and playing almost every hand, Vince and I looked at each other and said, whoa, <laughs> this is going to be a hit. Anybody that plays poker is going to love this because of the action involved. That would have been the first experience you've ever had of actually seeing someone's secrets from start to finish. Yeah, that was the first one. You know, Now, I knew about Stu Unger's secrets because he played a little bit like Gus back in those days. <laughs> he was bluffing every pot as well. But not many people do it, especially when you're playing back in those days. Every event was over a million to the winner, way over a million. Mm. I think that first event was like 1.8 million, 1.6 to the winner or something. I mean, wow. it was massive money wow. back then. And... Uh, Gus, good-looking guy, he's like a world-class backgammon player, maybe the best in the world at that time, but in the poker world, nobody knew who he was. But uh, they knew him pretty fast because he not only won that event, he won two more events in the next year or two, and he became the biggest star in the World Poker Tour. So, uh, But watching him play and bluffing like he was doing, whew, it was riveting television. I'm telling you, it was powerful, fun to watch, and you know, I'm convinced that that first show at Bellagio is what made that show such a big success because it was such a great final table. Maybe to this day, the best final table we've ever had in the history of the WPT. Wow. And Steve took extra special time to edit that show, you know, and put it together. It took him months to do it. And then when he put it in the can, he took it around to all the major networks. He said, I've got the newest thing for television, poker. It's a new sport. Everybody's going to love it. And it's going to be a two-hour show. We want it on prime time. Every network turned him down. Mm -hmm. And ESPN then offered him a deal, but it was only one hour. Steve was adamant it was going to be two hours. It was going to be a start to finish and one show conclusion. You know, back in those days, Steve didn't want anybody to know that they started playing six days earlier. He was just going to try to trick them. It was just six guys playing for this kind of money, you know, and watching it live. And so anyway... That's how it all came about there with the World Poker Tour, and it was exciting stuff, and it was a popular time to be around. And, uh, you know, I was very fortunate that Steve offered me the job as commentator. As I said, he had filmed my last tournament of champions that I did back in 1999. When it was over, he said, Mike, he said, wow, that was the best job of poker commentary I've ever heard. I didn't think much more about it. But then finally, when the World Poker Tour got underway, or was getting ready to start, and he was looking for commentators, uh, he chose me as one of the two commentators, and Vince Van Patten, he wanted a Hollywood connection for the other guy. Well, it was off to a start when Steve could find a network to put it on. Mm -hmm. That was the problem for him. He had the show in the can from Bellagio. He took it around to all the major studios and said, I've got the newest thing for television, the biggest sport, it's going to be the greatest show ever. It's the World Poker Tour. And all the network said, poker. He said, yes, poker. It's going to be ravishing, exciting, phenomenal television. And it's going to be a two-hour show. He wanted a two-hour show on prime time every week for the World Poker Tour, and all the networks turned him down, all the major networks. ESPN, I think, offered him a one-hour deal, but Steve was adamant the show was going to be two hours. He wanted to start and finish to every show, and he didn't want to carry it week to week. So if you started watching it, you could see who was going to win that night before you went to bed. And so, but he was devastated. He couldn't get it on a network. Just previous to that, he had filmed the Party Poker Million which was the event that we put on from Party Poker on a cruise ship. We were guaranteeing a million dollars to the winner in a Lemon Hold'em tournament. And once we got the qualifiers, we were on the ship, Steve Lipscomb came to me. I'd done a documentary with him once at the World Series back in the 90s. And he said, Mike, he said, I think I can put the Party Poker Million on TV and it won't cost you anything. I said, whoa, that'd be great. He had a budget of just like 40000 is all. And he put the, World, the Party Poker Million on the Travel Channel, as a special show, and it was the biggest show they ever had on there. So it was a big hit, was the Party Poker Million. Mm -hmm. So now when all the networks turned him down, he now went back to Discovery Networks and to see if they wanted to put on the World Poker Tour. Because that Party Poker Million was so popular on their network, 
and they had a little history with Steve and knew what kind of work he did, they said, we're going to give you a shot. So they put the World Poker Tour on the Travel Channel every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, steady, and Wednesday night became Poker Night Across America, and the rest, as they say, is history. We were on the Travel Channel the first five seasons of the World Poker Tour. It was their number one rated show all five years. Wow. Yeah, fantastic. That is. And it was from there that we went to Fox Sports? That was there. No, we went to a couple. Okay. We went to the Game Show Network. <laughs> and I, I forget where else we went, but <laughs> a couple other places, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but now we're on Fox Sports, and it's just fantastic. And, you know, they've gotten behind the show, and it's just signed another four-year deal with them. And so it's really fantastic that the World Poker Tour has a nice home that appreciates them. And, you know, and the ratings are still good after all these years. So mm -hmm. everybody's happy. Absolutely. Well, you know what? I am starving, and I can smell the food. You want to have some dinner? Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Now, did you know Vince before you started working together? I actually did. I knew Vince from the 1990s. Actually, Vince and his dad were commentators on the main event of the World Series of Poker a couple of years back in the 90s. So I met him back then. I didn't really know him, but knew who he was and all. And then Steve Lipscomb, you know, selected me to be one of the commentators. And when he did, Lyle Berman, who was funding the World Poker Tour, said, What? Mike Sexton, are you crazy? He said, He's just a poker player. You know, is that who you want there? And Steve said, that's my man. I said, I want him. Aww. And Lyle was so against it. He said, he won't last one show. And, Lyle, and then Steve said, well, he said, that's my man. I'm going to start with him. And Vince Van Patten, who'd been playing poker since he was a kid like I had, you know, and knew all the people in Hollywood, was the other choice that he had made. So we were brought together at Bellagio for the first day. Now, Vince had obviously no idea what the World Poker Tour was. They hired him. He thought it was a one-day gig. He drove in from Palm Springs on the day of that final table wow. at Bellagio in the morning. Mm. And we started the event, and the event went until like 4 in the morning. And Vance at midnight, you know how tired he gets at nighttime, <laughs> he literally passed out at like midnight, and he was done for the rest of the show. Nothing has changed. I, I actually <laughs> talked for the next four hours by myself, and the way Lyle felt about me, and Vance passing out, I didn't think either one of us were going to get past the first week. <laughs> and here we made it 15 years together, and... Uh, it's just been a joy working with Vance, i got to tell you. He's a, especially back in the early days, because he grew up in television. He grew up in the movies in a, in a Hollywood family. And he made it so comfortable for me. I was never in a high school play. And here I was going to be on national television as a commentator, you know. And I was so scared that first show that we did at Bellagio. Mm -hmm. I down like six beers to try to calm my nerves there before the show started a little bit. <laughs> and uh, But Vance has always been a, a staple and, you know, relax and, you know, we... We, we would like each other. We love poker. We love to gamble. We have a lot in common, and it's just worked out great. And you just couldn't find a better man to work with than Vince Van Patten. Oh, I Been agree. Lucky. I'll never forget the first time I met the two of you when I started working with the World Poker Tour. And we were, at, uh, we were in L.A. at the Bicycle Casino, and you said, come on, Lynn, we're taking you to the bar. And you and Vince took me to the bar, and I was like, this is so surreal. I cannot believe it. Because <laughs> it was the first time I'd met the two of you properly in real life. And, uh, I mean, I'd interviewed you before, but I've never seen the two of you together, you know. And it was exactly, you two in real life are exactly the same as you are on TV. And you're sitting there, and you're looking at the TV, and you're betting on whatever game was happening. And it's just, that, that, that's you two, you're... Your chemistry is, well, is priceless. We were so happy to have you, and it was nice to meet you, and, and the World Poker Tour is lucky to get you, and, oh, and so you. it's just been uh, fantastic having you on board for sure. Thank and you. And you've been such a delight. Oh, it's been an honor to work with you. <laughs> Let's eat a little more, huh? <laughs> If you could describe World Poker Tour in one word, what would it be and why? Phenomenal. Mm. Really, because it literally changed the poker world forever. Before the World Poker Tour came around, as I said before, you can find a no limit hold'em game in any casino in the country. And now, virtually, that's what most casinos have is no limit hold'em games. And it's just been the most, the number one reason in the world by far for the growth of poker has been the World Poker Tour. When there was that big poker explosion back right after the turn of the century, you know, some people like to credit Moneymaker at the World Series win, which was big. 
online poker was coming into effect then. But it was the World Poker Tour. Make no mistake about it. Without a doubt, that was the reason for the explosion of poker and the popularity of poker grew was because of the televised TV show, The World Poker Tour. Yeah. Cheers to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think all poker players, and in fact, everybody that works in the poker industry, owes a debt of gratitude, not only to Steve Lipscomb and to Lyle Berman, but Steve said he would have never put the World Poker Tour together had Audrey Kania with business and marketing and Robin Motor in production come on board with him. He wasn't going to do it by himself, and those two knew nothing about poker, of course, and they agreed to take on this new concept of the World Poker Tour. And, you know, without them, it may have never got off the ground. So, you know, I think all of us owe them a debt of gratitude, and certainly everybody in the poker industry today that's working today probably wouldn't be working in the industry if it wasn't for the World Poker Tour. So I think everyone owes Steve Lipscomb a debt of gratitude that we can never repay, honestly, because he literally grew poker more than any person in the history of the game. Oh, cheers, Steve. Thank you. That's true. <laughs> and he stuck by me in the early days. Yes. Why I was trying to get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> Steve's got good vision. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how much did your life change when you started with the World Poker Tour? Well, it changed dramatically. You know, the first part of the change was I'd played tournament poker for 15 years prior to the World Poker Tour starting. And Steve said, look, you know, when he was going to hire me for the job, he said, I've got good news and bad news. I want you to be the commentator on the World Poker Tour. But the bad news is if you take the job, you can't play in any of the tournaments. Mm -hmm. So the first seven years on the World Poker Tour, eight years, Vince and I weren't allowed to play WPT events. We would literally just fly in the night before the final table, do the final table, and fly out of town. Was it a tough decision to make when you were a dedicated tournament player? It wasn't tough player? at all for me because it was a new challenge. I thought it might be big and popular. It was going to be fun to be on television. Mm -hmm. And I really relished the idea of trying something different and doing this. And I thought I could do a decent job at it, and it would be challenging. So it, it, I didn't miss playing in the tournaments at the time. Obviously, who knew they were going to play for that kind of money you know, every week? But still, I'd much rather have taken the job as commentator on the World Poker Tour. Only one person, two people in the world can have that job. You know, there's thousands of poker players out there, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, to be picked as one of those two was very special. So then eventually after about, what, eight seasons or after so? about eight seasons, remember, all the casinos had to sign up for a 10-year contract with the World Poker Tour when they signed on. Uh -huh. So now when it was getting time to renew their contracts, the WPT started thinking of ways, you know, what can we do to embellish our casino partners? And one of the things was, was to have the talent there all week long during the tournament to make it a much better atmosphere for the players and the casino and uh, more of a WPT event. So they promised the casino partners that we would be there from day one and through the final table. So once they allowed that, they said, look, since you've got to be there on day one anyway, you guys can go ahead and play the tournaments if you want. Now, Steve Lipscomb at that time had now left the World Poker Tour. And so once he was gone, then we were allowed to play uh, in WPT events. And I was really excited about it because... You know, I envied those guys playing for that kind of money all those years and wanted to get in there and mix it up with it. And at that time, there were so many young, great players coming up on board and so skilled and so talented that it was going to be fun for me to play with them, and uh, I was going to enjoy it. So I thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to get to play in WPT event. How did that feel, taking your first seat in WPT event after so many years? Well, it felt great. You know, yeah. I just loved it, and I think it was the second year on the WPT that I made my first final table, which was at the Bay 101. And I finished sixth in that tournament, but just getting to the final table was fun, and it was a good experience. And it took me the third time to the final table before I got fortunate to win back in season 15. But you know, I made two final tables in season 15, so that was pretty good. It was a fantastic season for you. Yeah. Nice. Would you say that finally winning the title was your biggest highlight of your World Poker Tour experience? Well, it was certainly, <laughs> obviously, a goal. Because the year previous to that, they created the event, the WPT Tournament of Champions. And I created the original Tournament of Champions of Poker back in the 90s that I ran for three years, which I still believe was like the greatest event in poker history. It was just phenomenal. So I'm a big Tournament of Champions fan. I won the 2006 World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions for a million dollars. And now the WPT was starting a Tournament of Champions. The catch was you had to be a champion on the Champions Cup to be eligible to play in the WPT Tournament of Champions, and of course I wasn't. So I was very jealous and envious of guys that got in that tournament 
because I couldn't play it. And then, thank heavens, in season 15, uh, I got fortunate and won a WPT title where now I'm able to play for the rest of my life. And uh, as long as I'm healthy, as long as I can get to the venue, I promise you I will be playing in every WPT Tournament of Champions. Well, you only actually had to wait until the second year of the Tournament of Champions yeah. to be eligible to play. So that's testament <laughs> to the power of your dedication to a goal and making it happen. Are you going to win one? So, Well, I mean, I hope so. Obviously, you're up against all champions. It's tough, but, uh, uh, you know, you dream about winning it. And I'm going to be trying to win it for sure because I love the concept. All champions competing to see who's the ultimate champion every mm -hmm. year. To me, that's fantastic. And what the WPT now and marketing director David Gitter and his staff have put together with added prizes and adding 100000 to the prize pool and cars and all the perks of the bags and everything that the players get, the way they comp you, the way they take care of you, I mean, truly might be the number one value in poker. Even though you're playing against the, very, the toughest field in poker, you know, the value of the event itself with all the perks and all the added prizes, uh, I don't know how you can beat it. So as a poker player... If you won a WPT title, I really don't understand how you could possibly think about skipping that event. I agree. Let's have a main course. What do you say? Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> So, Mike, you've been playing poker for, what, like 40 years? Professionally, 40 years. I've been playing since I was 13 years old, but professionally since 1977, wow. where I literally quit my job, had no paychecks, and literally started playing poker for a living. So what were you doing before that? Well, you know, when I was a kid, I caddied a lot to make money, and then I had a newspaper route uh, to make money. But my first paycheck job, I was a busboy when I was in high school at Imperial House South in Centerville, Ohio. And I did that for three years part-time to make money. So, mm. it, uh, and let me tell you, it's like the toughest job I ever had. The bus <laughs> you know, when we were kids, we'd sell donuts door-to-door -door and strawberries, and I sold encyclopedias one summer. I mean, you know, you're always trying to hustle, you know, to make money as a kid, you know, some kind of way. And But the first paycheck job, which I really appreciated, it was so nice to get a paycheck, you know. And that was what was nice about taking the WPT job, to have a paycheck again. You won't call a poker player with no paycheck. Getting yeah. a paycheck was nice. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I know poker players like the freedom, and they like, uh, you know, which is the best part about being a professional poker player is the freedom that you have and, the, you know, the spare time, and if you don't want to go to work today, you don't have to, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you all, nice to have a paycheck as well of as a backup. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a roller coaster being the uh, poker player, entrepreneur type lifestyle, <laughs> <laughs> gambling. <laughs> Well, life's a gamble, as they say. That's right. <laughs> so it keeps us young, isn't it? Well, it does. It keeps the heart fluttering, you know? Uh-huh. And it is exciting. It's just like, you know, I don't want anybody else to bet on sports a lot and, you know, ruin their bankrolls like I did on numerous occasions most of my life. <laughs> but I do think it's so much more exciting to have a wager on a game that you're watching on TV. You know, I think it's sort of un-American not to have a bet on the Super Bowl, for example, you know? I think everybody should have $20, a dinner, something where you have a rooting interest and it makes the game so much more fun to watch. Yeah. Do you think that's what's kept you so youthful throughout your entire life? I mean, you, you really do ride a roller coaster of emotions with your career, uh, with punting on a sport, like you said, even if you're at dinner, traveling the world. I don't know about keeping me young, but I know I kept me broke all my life. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> that much for sure. But... Uh, you know, I I was voted the youngest looking guy at my high school reunion, so, you know, hey. a 25 year reunion. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how many more reunions. But, but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I'm just, maybe I have the genes, but maybe, uh, you know, just enjoying life. You know, we were so fortunate, you know, to have a job like with the World Poker Tour for something that you really love that you don't consider a job. You yeah. know, anybody, I don't care what field they're in, if they work at something that's that they love and they don't consider it a job, it just makes life so much more better. And that, yeah. you know, many poker players fit in that category because they love to play poker like I did for years and years. I mean, the number one thing I would tell anybody who's thinking about being a professional poker player is don't even consider it if you don't love to play poker. Not like to play poker. Mm -hmm. Love to play the game. Yeah. Because if you, I don't care how good you are. I don't care if you win at it. If you're miserable playing, you're going to be miserable in life. You know, if you don't want to be there, if you think it's agony, if it's torture to go up and down and you're miserable being in the casino playing, 
you know, then poker's not the game for you. You shouldn't play it for a living anyway. And, you know, I just think that you need to pick a career in life, obviously something that you enjoy, that you have a passion for. And if you do, you know, when it's not, you don't think of it as a job, you know, you're going to be so much happier in life. And I've been so blessed all my life virtually. As a poker player, I loved it. You know, when I put on the Tournament of Champions, I loved it. When I started with Party Poker, I loved it. When I started with the World Poker Tour, I loved it and still love it, incidentally. So, you know, I've never gotten tired of it. So, you know, I've been very blessed in that regard that, you know, I've done things my whole life that I really love doing. That's some beautifully wise words, Mike. I totally agree. I don't say many wise words. You say a lot of wise words. <laughs> <laughs> They're some of my favorites. <laughs> oh, you're getting me all emotional. <laughs> Now you're going to hand over your reins to Tony Dunst. Well, it turns out Tony's going to take my place. He'll do a great job. And, you know, I learned in the Army a long time ago. They said nobody is irreplaceable. And that was a mantra that they had in the Army back in those days. And certainly Mike Sexton and WPT fits that mantra. And when you look down in history and you see Monday Night Football thrive without Howard Cosell, you know, uh, the Tonight Show went on just fine without Johnny Carson. You know, the World Poker Tour, when they lost Steve Lipscomb and Audrey Kania and Robin Motor, has done fantastic these past few years, and they've done well. So the World Poker Tour is going to be just fine without Mike Sexton. You know, I'm going to miss it probably more than it's going to miss me. Oh, I don't know about that. It's going to be a big gaping hole in our hearts, Mike. Well, my heart is to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> oh. Don't cry. I'm not going to disappear. <laughs> I know. Oh. Hmm. Well, we're going to see a lot of you at Tournament of Champions, aren't we? We are. And, you know, depending on what my schedule allows, I hope to play a few more WPD events during the year. So, yeah. you know, I hope to be around. I still want to play and compete and have fun and be around everybody at the World Poker Tour because I... Obviously, as you know, you know, it really is a family, and I feel part of it, and I hope that I'm not extradited from the family, you know. Oh, stop. I, I hope to always be a part of it, and, and uh, I obviously am rooting nothing but the best for the World Poker Tour and everybody that works there because, as you know, they're all such wonderful people, uh, headed by Adam Pliska. I don't tell you you could ever have a better boss than this guy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the executive staff is fantastic. The production crew is fantastic. You know, I look at people like Kristen Cranford, who was at the World Poker Tour from day one. Her uh -huh. sister was Robin Motor, who was one of Steve's partners back in the day, but she was there. When I reminisce about the early days, I just, you know, it just brings such amazing memories back, how we just started and how they started and, and how they put it all together. And uh, in the office, they would have, Kristen's dogs would actually sleep right in the office there with them, you know, Aww. it was just fantastic. And uh, it was, those are fun times that you remember, you know. I can remember the legendary poker player Chip Reese, the youngest member of the Poker Hall of Fame. You know, he always said to me, you know, that climbing the ladder to the top is always more fun than when you get there. I never agreed with him because once I got there, it was much better. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I understand the concept of that, and it really is. It's so challenging and satisfying that when you're climbing to get something to the top and uh, become really prominent at it, it really is It's fun taking that ladder of success. and. When you get to the top, you know, you feel very proud. And certainly the World Poker Tour got there, and I was just proud to be a part of it. So 15 great years with the World Poker Tour, and you're moving on now. What's made you move on? Well, it's very tough. And as you know, in marriages, sometimes people separate. In business, sometimes people separate. You know, Party Poker used to own the World Poker Tour, and then B-Win, and now GBC. But now, after all these years, the World Poker Tour is sort of becoming Switzerland in the poker world. They want to be able to work with everybody and not just one online site. And I understand that, and I appreciate that. I think they're on the right tack for that. But you have to realize that I've been with Party Poker longer than I've been with the World Poker Tour, honestly, and I sort of developed it. It was my baby, and it's grown up, and then it went dead for like four or five years, and now they're bouncing back to the top. And honestly, I just got offered a position that I just didn't feel like I could turn down, and it's an opportunity for me that... You know, obviously he's never going to come along again uh, to be the chairman of Party Poker. And, uh, you know, because of the, you know, the economics, the potential of it, uh, you know, it's just 
it's something I felt I had to take for me and my family. So, you know, I'm making the move. Sad to leave the World Poker Tour, obviously, but I don't feel like I'm ever going to leave the World Poker Tour. It'll always be a part of me. There's no question about it. But this was just an opportunity, uh, you know, that I felt like I had to take. Of course. Will this mean less travel? Can you uh, settle a little bit more? Well, I'm not sure about the travel. All the travel, most of it's going to be overseas because there's no online poker in the United States. Mm -hmm. So all the events that I'll be going to, I will be traveling overseas, like to Russia and the Dominican Republic and Punta Cana. And, you know, they may be going to, they're in England and Canada and maybe Brazil. And, you know, I don't know what's on the schedule yet, but uh, so the travel will be farther. <laughs> maybe not as much as the World Poker Tour, but, uh, you know, with all the travel, it'll be as many miles at least probably. <laughs> it's going to be all right. It's going to be exotic. <laughs> so. All right. Now tell us about... Some of your greatest memories of the World Poker Tour. Who are you most satisfied to see win? Well, besides me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a great thrill. But, but honestly, probably the most excited that I got was in season two or three when Doyle Brunson won the Legends of Poker. Mm. He was the first World Series of Poker main event champion that won a WPT title. And he's a good friend of mine. He's the godfather of poker. He wrote the iconic Bible of poker, as they say, uh, the super system, and... You know, it was just so, I was so happy to see Doyle win that tournament because it elevated the WPT status as well. You know, and since that time, now we've had five guys that are main event world champions that have won WPT titles. And, you know, Carlos Morton has done it. Uh, your fellow Aussie has done it. Yes, Joe Hashem. Joe Hashem. Uh, Dan Harrington has done it. Just this past season, Ryan Reese has done it. Scotty Wynn has done it. Maybe we're up to six winners now of main event winners and WPT title holders. And I just think that that elevates the status, you know, because those guys are considered the iconic, you know, poker champions of the world. But winning a WPT title is a very prestigious thing, and I just love it when world champions win WPT titles because I think it's just fantastic for the World Poker Tour. So I'm happy to see all those guys win. And, uh, you know, so probably the guys I root for the most are – Old school big name players because, you know, I'm an old school guy. And to this day, honestly, the guys that won the first four or five seasons on the World Poker Tour, even though we know they're not anywhere near as good as the players are today, they're still the biggest names in the poker world huh. because they were on television when the World Poker Tour started, and that's who people recognize on TV. Mm -hmm. They became the biggest stars, mm -hmm. and it's just that way. That's the way it is even today. Now, to become a big name in poker... You can't just win one WPT title. You have to win multiple titles. Or, you know, you've got to win multiple events around the world. You can't do it with winning just one event like you could back in the days of the World Poker Tour because there wasn't much more that existed back in those days, you know, than when we first started, other than the World Series of Poker events. So uh, I'm an old school guy. I love old school players. And I admire the path that those guys took prior to television coming into poker. You know, to be a poker player back in those days where you didn't play for any kind of near the prize money that they play for today, you know, and to grind it out for a living, you know, I respect those guys, and, and I like it, and I'm so happy when I see any of them on the leaderboard or win a big tournament today, and it, it pleases me. So you're going to hand over the reins to Tony Dunst. Tony and Vince, what do you think about that pairing? Well, they've had some good experience. I think three times this season I made a couple final tables, and they worked together. Mm -hmm. So they've had some experience together, and... Obviously, Tony's been on the raw deal now, I think, like four years. So he's television savvy now, as we say. Uh, he knows the job. I think it'll be a smooth transition, and I don't see any problem. Tony, obviously, a great player himself, uh, one of the young guns, a WPT champion. So certainly you're going to have expertise in the booth along with Vince. But incidentally, I don't think the players out there respect how good Vince really plays poker. They sort of make fun of his poker playing because when he plays WPT events, he just doesn't have the patience. He tries to bluff his money off all the time. They pick him off. He's out by the first break all the time. <laughs> but I played so many cash games with Vince in Beverly Hills and in Malibu. And believe me, he's got a much better game than these young guys think he did. So <laughs> don't be fooled by Vince's poker game. The guy can play when he wants to play. But uh, uh, Tony, you know, terrific player himself. So they're going to do just fine, and uh, I, I wish him the best. You now people say, how's it been so successful for so long? And the truth is, it's reality TV at its finest. These are real people that have put up real money that are really playing for life-changing money on the turn of a card. That kind of drama, that kind of excitement 
is mesmerizing to a TV audience, and that's why the WPT exists. It's why it's been so popular and why it's going to keep on going. Absolutely. Reality TV at its finest. We're all investing on the risk of return of a card. So, Mike, what do you think about players these days compared to the old school days? Well, the players today are so good. It's sort of scary how good, and not just a few players. I'm talking about thousands of players that are really, really terrific players. You know, people ask me what's the difference in today's players and the old school players. You know, back in the old days, you had guys like Amarillo Slim and Puggy Pearson. And these kind of characters were actually pool players that had poker games in the back of the pool hall. And they realized they could make more money at the poker, so they started playing poker instead of pool. You know, nowadays, you have college-educated, very, very intelligent guys that have chosen poker as a career. And they study the game thoroughly. And, of course, now with all the ways that you can become better at poker, you know, with the online poker is number one where you play millions of hands in a couple months. A guy can play more hands in a couple months than I played in 40 years, you know, and that's a big edge for them yeah. to get that kind of experience in such a short period of time. They're so smart. They catch on. They read all the books. And, you know, because of their work ethic and, and the intelligence level that they have, it, it's just amazing how good they are nowadays. And, in fact, you know, when people ask me if they want to become a poker player today, a pro, I would discourage it because I know how tough it is. It's tough out there. And it's no different than somebody wants to play on the PGA Tour or play in the NBA or play in the NFL. You know, only such a very small percentage of really great athletes get to that level. What's well, no different in poker. For those to succeed at the highest level in poker, I mean, you've got to be above the best. And, you know, you also have to have luck, I believe, a little bit of luck in tournaments early in your career. You know, when you're in your young 20s and you're fortunate enough to win a poker tournament that, for a million dollars, you know, it makes life much easier for you. Now, the problem is you may think you're much better than you really are because you got lucky in one tournament earlier in your career and won a lot of money. It makes it easier. Whereas you might not win a tournament for 10 years. I mean, it's tough out there. In 10 years' time, if Ty comes to you and says, Dad, I want to be like you and be a poker pro, <laughs> what will your response Say, be? No, forget about it. Get a job. Get a paycheck. <laughs> I actually, people ask me that all the time. And my son is eight years old now. He'll be nine soon. And I, I really have not ever talked poker with him. You know, he watches the show once in a while, you know, and he's proud to tell his friends that my, his dad's on TV. He's a poker champion and all this. But, you know, truthfully, I've never taught him how to play. I don't want him to play. And the sad part is his cousins, his same age, know how to play. And when we get together, they want to play <laughs> poker. But, uh, you know, I know how tough it is to make it out there. I know the ups and downs. I don't believe there's any sport in the world that takes more mental toughness than it does to be a tournament poker pro. None. I don't care what it is. Mm. They talk about the pressure of golf, the pressure of tennis. Forget about it. Doesn't compare to being a poker player. Where the ups and downs, and mostly downs, you know, and you can play a perfect poker tournament and get your money in with two aces before the flop and get broke yeah. and be walking out the door, and it happens over and over and over again. And if you can't deal with that mentally... You're going to go to the padded cell. I mean, literally, you could drive yourself crazy. Mm -hmm. So you have to be so tough mentally to overcome that and come back the next time, you know, with a fresh mind and try again. And it's not easy to do. You know, it's not. It's tough. And I so salute the guys that make it out on tour, and they're willing to grind it out as a poker player And because it's not easy, even in the cash games now, if you're just a cash game player. Players are much better now than they were 20 years ago. You know, and you have to be better as well. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I salute anybody that chooses it as a profession and can make it as a profession. So they've got my respect, I can tell you that. But as far as my son getting into it, ah, I hope he gets a job and gets a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> but after he gets out of college, if he really wanted to play it and do it, I would help him. Oh, What's the worst bad beat you've ever seen? Oh, boy. We had one at the Bay 101 one year. I think there were about five players left. And one player's got two kings, and another player's got two sevens. And the flop comes king, five, five. Mm -hmm. Now, think about that. King, five, five. Mm -hmm. And now the other guy catches seven, seven to make four sevens to win the pot. Wow. Now, can you imagine if you're at a final table and you flop kings full against a pair of sevens and you lose the pot, <laughs> you have to just want to head... Right toward, this was a Bay 101, right toward the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge and just hop right off of it 
because you think, wow, it's just downhill from here. <laughs> I love it. He just placed himself mentally in the location and thought, where is the closest place to commit suicide? <laughs> Uh, but the guy was running so bad he'd probably jump off the bridge and just be wounded in the hospital the rest of his life and, no. and, and couldn't even finish the job you know or somebody have to feed him the rest of his life that unlucky no. that unlucky <laughs> well what are you going to miss the most about World Poker Tour well, I'm going to miss the most I'm going to miss Vince I'm going to miss you I'm going to miss the staff the production crew uh, the live updates team you know just hanging around everybody in the WPT family that's really the really special part of the job is you know, that people don't see on the air, is that really how close everybody really is? And, and you know, I, I'm definitely going to miss that. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite player on the World Poker Tour? Well, favorite player on the World Poker Tour, there's so many good players out there, it's just hard to pick now. But my favorite player of all time would be Chip Reese and the, as the best all-around poker player, playing multiple games. But I still believe Stu Unger is the greatest no limit holding player of all time. It's just so sad to me to see that he didn't live long enough to make it to the World Poker Tour. And, you know, he had serious drug problems and cocaine problems and, you know, died relatively young. And he was the Bobby Fisher of poker, in my opinion. He had that kind of talent, the genius IQ, photographic memory. Was a phenomenal poker player, won the main event of the World Series three times. And I truly believe, had he lasted long enough to make it to the World Poker Tour, that he would have been the biggest star in the world for a tour by this much, and whoever was in second will be down here. That's how much I believe in, in his game. Now, I know players today play as aggressive as he did, maybe more so, but, you know, I just saw this guy. He just had a, a sixth sense of being able to put a player on a hand that I've never seen anybody else have that kind of sense. And he knew when he can take a pot away from a guy, and he did it over and over and over. So, to me, Stu Unger will be the greatest no-limit holding player of all time, but I'll tell you, there's so many good ones out there today. Whew. It's hard to keep you know, up. It's hard. It's tough to pick one. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to say? Well, I do. I'm very proud of the World Poker Tour for their charitable contributions. The WPT Foundation does so much good for so many people in need, yeah. and I just love that. Yeah. And as you know, we do the Children's Hospital event in New York. We do the Tiger Jam every year, Tiger Woods' charity event, as well as some others. And it's just fascinating to me to see poker take such a role in contributing to charity events. And, you know, poker is now the number one way to raise money for charities in the United States, surpassing golf tournaments. So I think everybody in the poker industry can be proud of that. And certainly the WPT is one of the forefront of, of sponsoring charity events. And, and I'm very proud of the WPT Foundation. I'm also happy that they've gone out and sought out sponsorship for poker. And poker's become so popular on television and elsewhere that sponsors are now coming into poker and want to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I think it's great that companies like Hublot and uh, you know, Monster, Monster and a lot of other companies, obviously, sponsoring the WPT at the Tournament of Champions. And, you know, I think this is a tremendous direction that we need to go to where they can add prizes or money to the prize pool for the players. So we really are global. The World Poker Tour is global. Where do you see it going from here? I see it continuing to expand globally, and I see what the World Poker Tour has done just these past couple seasons. We've gone to China with events. You know, now you've gone to Amsterdam and Europe and various places over there. Uh, we're going to, they're going to Uruguay next year, I understand, down in South America for the first time ever. Uh, this is fantastic to see the expansion of the World Poker Tour go so global, and hopefully one day they get to Australia. That's your country. What's happening here? Don't you have any connections down there? <laughs> I agree. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> One day we'll get there. <laughs> but the point is, poker is expanding globally. The WPT is expanding right with it globally. And obviously, the newest market that everybody is raving about as a poker player that they know will be the biggest explosion in poker history is the Asian market and the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that really takes off like everybody's hoping it will, wow, who knows what the potential of poker can be. And the Brazilian market. It's going crazy down there, south yeah, of the border. It's huge. Now, over the years, we've seen so many companies in poker come and go. You know, it's no secret that it's hard to stand the test of time. What is it about the World Poker Tour, do you think, that has allowed it to, to survive for so long and still thrive? Well, I think poker is a game that everybody loves. Honestly, it's got the right combination of skill and luck. 
you know, that makes it attractive to everybody, where everybody can win if they get lucky and catch some cards. Mm -hmm. We've seen that happen on the World Poker Tour, where amateurs or novice and recreational players win WPT titles, and that's fun, as well as all the top pros winning them. And uh, that's exciting. But the World Poker Tour has been around, I believe, because the quality of product that they produce is second to none. I mean, I believe the TV show is the best in the business. You know, the people that work at the World Poker Tour are all professional. The leadership, the executive staff of the WPT is phenomenal, and they've led us, obviously, to the expansion and growth of the World Poker Tour everywhere. And, you know, I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory that that's the reason that the WPT has been so successful for so long. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have this dinner with you, Mike. Man, it's always a pleasure dining with you. Mm. I thoroughly enjoy it. I'm going to miss these, our, our pre-final table dinners. Hey. <laughs> Became a little ritual on the World Poker Tour, That's didn't good. it? I may surprise you and show up at events, but we're still going out to dinner. I'm exactly. Okay. And hopefully it's when you are a player at the final uh, table. That would be nice. That would be nice. <laughs>